Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Now, after hearing those words of Jesus this morning, anyone who says, you fool, will be liable to the fires of hell, you may be thinking that we're going to have a hard sermon. <laughs> but don't worry, we're just going to talk about money. <laughs> Seriously, uh, we'll save that passage for another time. Um, but as the book of First Chronicles tells it, King David's reign in Jerusalem, well, it was bookended. It was bookended by two magnificent worship services. King David, he held the first one at, at the beginning of his reign in Jerusalem when, when he brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city, the physical place of God's presence, the Ark, into Jerusalem. And King David was, was wholly and personally given over to ecstatic joy in this moment. First Chronicles 15 describes the ark entering the city with, with the sound of the horn, trumpets and cymbals, and with loud music on harps and lyres. And in the middle of it all, King David himself is, is dancing and celebrating so much that, that he embarrassed his wife, Michael. <laughs> Wives, being embarrassed by their husbands? Public antics? <laughs> I mean, hard to believe, but there it is in the Bible. And the second worship service, well, it's the one we heard about this morning in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And this moment, this moment is at the very end of David's life. Or maybe a better way to put it is that it is at the culmination, at the completing of his kingship. Because as First Chronicles tells it, King David has spent much of the time between, between that first worship service when the ark comes into Jerusalem and this last one, he spent much of that time working endlessly for one goal. And that is getting everything in order to build God's house, to build the temple, the, the resting place of his glory. He buys the site for the temple and constructs an altar there in chapter 21 of 1 Chronicles. In chapter 22, he sets the stone cutters to work. He organizes the Levites and the, the temple servers in chapter 23, the priests in chapter 24, the, the musicians in chapter 25, and, and the gatekeepers and treasurers in chapter 26. By the time we arrive at our passage today in 1 Chronicles 29, well, there is just, just one thing left to do before King David's anointed heir, his son Solomon, can actually begin the work of building the temple itself. And that one thing left, it is to take the offering, to collect the wealth required to, to finally construct and furnish the temple with all the beauty and glory and magnificence that it has been planned to have. So let's look there together. Turn with me now to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. This is on page 356 in the Blue Bibles. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. All right. You see, at the beginning of chapter 29, it says that King David, he actually led the way in this offering, just as he has led the way in all these other preparations he's made for the temple. This is verse two, he says, so I have provided for the house of the Lord my God, the, the gold for the things of gold and the silver for the things of silver. And then chapter 29 describes how King David's generous giving to the temple has, has been followed by offerings from others from tribal leaders, from, from military officers, from, from heads of household. 
basically everyone else in Israel is participating in this offering. When you get a whole nation to participate in an offering, the, the pile of precious things that, that King David has collected for the temple, well, it's staggering. Chapter 29, verses 4 through 7, well, it catalogs thousands and thousands of pounds of, of gold and silver and, and actually hundreds of thousands of pounds of bronze and iron. By the way, uh, in that portion, you see the word talent a lot. The talent's a weight, it's about 60 pounds, give or take, if that helps you get a sense of the scale that David is talking about or that First Chronicles is talking about. Now, I'm dating myself here a little bit, but, but I imagine this great gathering of wealth, well, looking something like Scrooge McDuck's money pit <laughs> from those old cartoons, but, but actually in the reverse. Because this is not wealth to be squirreled away and, and, and swam in by a, by a miser. It's all a gift, a gift to God, to be used to build this temple, to bring honor and glory and worship and majesty to him. And the actual collecting of this great gift, well, it's also for King David here in 1 Chronicles 29, a reason to worship in that very moment. To bless, as our reading says, to bless God. Also translate that as praise God, to praise God. And you know, that's what King David does here. And he uses words that, that we still use, sometimes here on Sundays when we take our offering here at Epiphany. Maybe you caught that from verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom and you are exalted as head above all. Remember those words? We sometimes say them around the offering. And if we are saying them, we skip ahead a little bit to verse 14. And, and I would say, all things come from you, O Lord. And you would reply back to me. And of your own have we given you. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. That piece of our liturgy comes from this moment in scripture. But this big worship service around a pile of money kind of begs a question, doesn't it? I mean, what's so worshipful about it? Seems almost a little odd. But King David, he has a very clear answer for this that he gives us here in 1 Chronicles 29. And he says it clearly in verse 11 that we just read together. And, and he says it again, even maybe a bit clearer in verse 16, where he says, O Lord, our God, all this abundance, that, that great pile of precious things that we have provided for the building you a house for your holy name, all this comes from your hand and is your own. In other words, friends, that massive offering they have just taken, that David has led the way in, this is not actually a display of, of David and his people's generosity to God. Instead, it is a display of God's generosity to them. That's what David is saying here. You see, to King David, this offering is evidence. It is evidence that God has blessed him, has blessed Israel so abundantly. And that causes him to praise and worship God. And you know what makes it even more amazing is that, is that David knows that the gathering of all this wealth, it's not like it's been automatic or easy. He knows that, that Israel, for instance, is not well established in this land they're in. He says in verse 15, for, for we are strangers before you and sojourners, visitors, as all our fathers were. And life, King David knows, well, well, it can be short and hard and unpredictable. Also in verse 15, he says, our days on earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. But still, 
Still, David is saying, God is so generous, and he's staring at the evidence of that generosity. And friends, that is a key thing to remember, for us to remember as we make our own offerings here on Sunday and and over the next week, prepare to bring forward our pledge cards on Stewardship Sunday. It is not about whether or not or by how much you will be generous to God. I know it might feel that way, but it is not about that. It is about acknowledging and celebrating God's generosity to you. It's about giving thanks. And to be honest, that's why we do it when we do it right at this time of Thanksgiving. And by the way, I know many of us travel. One of the things that we face every year is when to have Stewardship Sunday. And what I've discovered is there's never a good time to have Stewardship Sunday. Um, we do it at this point, and if you're here, I'd love to have you participate. Um, if you're not going to be here because you're with family or somewhere else, um, you can make your offering of your pledge card really at any time by bringing it up and making it part of the offering. But that's what it's about. It's about all of us recognizing God's generosity to us. And doing that without denying or setting aside the, the hardships and the challenges that we all face. Because friends, if I've learned anything in ministry, it's that we all face hardships and challenges. It is about recognizing that even through them, by God's grace, we all have something to give back. And that's part of the genius of the tithe, by the way. This is not a flat fee or, to use secular language, a regressive tax that demands more from those who have less. Instead, it's just 10%. 10% of a lot of an abundance, well, that's a tithe. 10% of very little, that's a tithe too. And Jesus himself reinforces this way of looking at things when when he speaks of that widow offering those two small copper coins in Luke chapter 21. Do you remember that story? They're in the temple. Jesus is watching, his disciples are watching. All these big wigs come forward with their money bags and dump them into the various offering uh, treasuries, chests. Um, and in the middle of it all, there's a little old lady with two tiny copper coins. And she drops them in. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. Because they gave a little out of their abundance. And proportionally, she gave much out of her poverty. So the offering, the offering here in 1 Chronicles 29 is first and foremost evidence, evidence of God's generosity to his people. And that evidence, it spurs King David and all the people to, to bless God, to praise God right there because they can see with their own eyes what he's given them. Now we're not building a temple, but our offering every Sunday and our pledge cards next week, they are the same sort of evidence. And they should also encourage us in our worship. They are evidence that we can see that God has been generous to us, that he has provided for us today. So remember that, reflect on it as you think about Pledge Sunday and participate next week. There's also one more aspect of the offering in 1 Chronicles 29 that, that I'd like us to reflect on this morning and that also applies as we think about and prepare for Stewardship Sunday. And that other aspect is simply this. You know that offering in 1 Chronicles 29? It was for doing something, right? King David isn't just, just collecting all this gold and silver and jewels and putting it in a pile and saying, that's a nice pile I have there. Let's all stare at it together and have a church service. No, this offering has a purpose. And its purpose is to build God's house, to build the temple, to make sure God is worshiped and glorified and adored in the place of his presence in Jerusalem. And that's another part of the, of the genius and the beauty of the tithe. Yes, we give it to God. 
But then, then he lets us as a group use it. We don't have a temple to build, but we do have a church to build up. This is certainly true here at Epiphany. Because you tithe, we have this place to worship on Sunday. And we can do boring things like pay our lease and make sure the heat is on, which seems especially convenient on this cold morning. And we can do things together as the church, like, like feed kids at Coates Elementary and pack Thanksgiving and Christmas food boxes and go over to Arbor Terrace and provide worship to people who can't come to us on Sunday and are often very alone. And we can support each other through mutual prayer of our prayer ministries. We can build relationships here that we can rely on as we navigate the ups and downs of our own lives. We can make sure that the next generation of kids, well, they learn the basics of the Christian faith as they prepare for a future in an increasingly secular world. And most importantly, we can be Christ's body in this place. A concrete expression, an enfleshment of the gospel in a world that desperately needs to taste and to see, not just read a theory somewhere, that the Lord is good and he is alive and he is present with his people. All these things depend on our tithe, on our return of a portion of God's generosity to us. So what does 1 Chronicles 29 give us to reflect on as we prepare for Stewardship Sunday? Well, first it reminds us that that our giving, it really isn't about our generosity to God. It is about God's generosity to each of us. As King David said, and we still repeat in our worship, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. Second, part of God's generosity to us is allowing us to take our tithes and build this concrete local church with them. Your giving, your tithing supports so much at Epiphany. And I'm grateful both to God and to you for it. Thank you. Now, before I close, I want to answer a few practical questions um, I hear from people when we get to this time of year. And I understand this may feel a bit awkward. I mean, this is a lot of money talk this morning. But I take comfort in the fact that Jesus was very awkward about money too. I mean, you know, Jesus spoke more about money than almost anything else. He spoke more about money than baptism, for instance. So here we go. First, who should tithe? Well, friends, if you have an income, whether you are young or old, tithing is a good thing to do. To be honest, I, I love seeing pledge cards from kids. I've gotten a few over the years filled out with crayons. It's wonderful. And if you'd like to use a crayon, you're welcome. That's fine. I love seeing those pledge cards from kids, even tithing a few dollars from their allowance. Tithing is just giving back to God from what he has given to us. There is no lower or upper bound for participating. We should all, and we can all participate so the second question I get, and that's a very honest question, is, well, what if I cannot afford to do that? Life is expensive. It's getting more expensive. Maybe you've noticed this. Well, I'm going to offer the same advice that Murray and Ginger Black shared with us last week. Friends, start where you are. Commit to giving a portion of the tithe, maybe, maybe 2% this year, and, and working your way up year on year until you reach 10%, a full tithe. Incidentally, that's actually what we have done as a church over the last 10 years. 10 years ago, we gave about 4% of our income to outreach and mission. And just this year, we got to a point that we're giving 10% of our income to outreach and mission. It seemed like if we're going to ask you to tithe, that maybe the church should do it too, huh? 
the same time, don't be surprised if somewhere along the way, you don't experience a moment like the blacks did and decide to take a leap to a full tithe sooner than maybe you thought. The spiritual benefits and blessings of tithing are real. And you will want them. Another question. Well, what counts? What counts as a tithe? And Christians can be all over the map on this one. Some people count all their charitable giving as their tithe. Other people say that the tithe is meant to go to the church. Now, some may suggest I am biased, (laughs) but I lean more towards thinking a tithe is meant for your local church. Giving in scripture, giving like we read about in 1 Chronicles, is aimed squarely at the place of worship. Giving beyond that is great to do, but the tithe builds the local church. While other organizations, well, they can have large pools of potential givers. Our church, well, just kind of has us. I'm happy if someone wants to come in and give us a grant off the street. I have never had that happen. (laughs) Another question I sometimes hear is, what if I don't know what my income will be next year? We've moved into a world that, that much more has people moving from job to job or doing some work here and some work there. And and first of all, I wanna say, I know how hard that is. I honor that if that's where you're at. And one of the unique things about how we do stewardship at Epiphany is that we do all of this without asking your name. Um, I don't know what anyone gives or doesn't give and I have no idea how that matches or doesn't match with a pledge card. Our dollar amounts on pledge cards, they do help us. They help us make sure we're not being uh, unwise in our budget. But if that's not practical for you because your income is not clear, because it fluctuates, let me just suggest committing to giving a proportion of your income. I saw that no, but I'm still saying yes. That's our treasurer. Charlie, stand up and wave at the people. Yeah, Yeah, sometimes we're just gonna have to do it God's way, Charlie. That was a knife, I'm sorry. That was mean of me. Charlie is wonderful. Charlie does things God's way and understands just how much um, God is in charge of our finances here at Epiphany. And I'm grateful for him and grateful for all that do that work for us. But anyway, back to the sermon. One final question I sometimes hear is, well, what do we tithe on? Do we tithe on our gross income or our net income? Do we tithe before or after taxes? Now, you know, when I get this question, um, first of all, I'm like, okay, you're into the weeds here. This is great, because it means you're thinking about this very seriously. Um, Logically, I I think the answer is clear. Um, We tithe on our gross income. We tithe on our income before taxes. And the reason for that is, is biblically, the description of the tithe is that it comes from the first fruits, right? You've heard this. Um, The first fruits are the first thing you harvest, the, the first part of your income. Um, Really, when we think about it, the question we really are asking is, well, who is first in line, right? God or the government? I think I know the answer to that question. So friends, next Sunday is Stewardship Sunday. And stewardship is a part of our discipleship at Epiphany. We take it seriously. At the same time, stewardship is this wonderful opportunity to see God's generosity to all of us displayed concretely here, locally. This church is God's generosity enfleshed. Pray this week about how you will participate and be prepared next Sunday to celebrate what God has given us, his generosity to each of us, not just what we're giving back to him. Amen.